Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Bible study on uh, John's Gospel. Today we're going to be getting into chapter 5. Uh, Jesus uh, does a miraculous healing at the Pool of Bethesda. We'll talk more uh, about that in just a moment. But before we begin, our opening psalm for today is Psalm 141. And um, as we read that, uh, let me share the introductory words on this psalm. If you're following in the Psalter, it's the italicized print at the very bottom of the page. I'll, I'll read that for us. So the church sings Psalm 141 to pray for rescue from temptation. Many Christians are accustomed to singing verse two as part of an evening service. Martin Luther said, Psalm 141 is a prayer psalm against godless teachers who appear to be friendly and speak smooth words rather than threats. The psalmist says it is better to be rebuked and corrected by godly teachers, even if evil comes upon us and we are uprooted and torn, suffering cross and death. It is better to trust in the Lord rather than in sweet false teaching. So just to, as we read this and you consider those words from Martin Luther, um, I want you to, uh, it's kind of setting the table because Jesus is going to come in contact with the Pharisees who got mad at him and rebuked him for performing a healing miracle on the Sabbath. That's basically what John chapter five is. And, um, and that rebuke is something that Jesus had to suffer and it was better that he suffer than that he not show love and the better that he suffer than that he fail to reveal who he is, uh, the, the true God. So we'll read from Psalm 141, and I will read the first line. I'll let you all respond with the, the indented uh, indented words, and I think, I think they're all just single lines that, this time. All right. I call to you, Lord, come quickly to help me. Hear me when I call to you. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not let my heart be drawn to what is evil, so that I take part in wicked deeds, along with those who are evildoers. Do not let me eat their delicacies. Let a righteous man strike me, that is a kindness. Let him rebuke me, that is oil on my head. My head will not refuse it, for my prayer will still be against the deeds of evildoers. Their rulers will be thrown down from the cliffs, and the wicked will learn that my words were well spoken. They will say, as one plows and breaks up the earth, so our bones have been scattered at the mouth of the grave. But my eyes are fixed on you, sovereign Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not give me over to death. Keep me safe from the traps set by evildoers, from the snares they have laid for me. Let the wicked fall into their own nets while I pass by in safety. And so we pray. Let our prayers be acceptable in your sight. Come and help us in time of need, that we may sing your praise in holy joy now and forever through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right, so as we wrap up, uh, wrap up uh, this section from John chapter four, I believe we, we finished, Jesus had done the evangelism work with that uh, social outcast, that Samaritan woman, uh, the water at the well, and Jesus gave her living water. And anything who is, anyone here last week want to share um, anything outstanding about that Samaritan woman's reaction to Jesus saying, I, um, I whom speaking to you am that Messiah. I am the Christ. Maybe not outstanding, maybe just anything that's that uh, any way that you want to say that she reacted. Mark. Well, she came there to get water out of the well, and uh, when she went back and left her container there to tell the people about what she did. 
Yeah, she came for water, and when she went back to share the message of Jesus, she forgot her water pitcher and all the water behind. Yeah, it, priorities shifted. Anyone else? Um, if we think about how she first shared the news with her friends, she went and said what she knew, but she didn't make anything up. This is, this is the one, could he be the Messiah? And then she followed it up by saying, come and check it out. Come and see, you decide for yourselves, right? She didn't proclaim it upon them, that, that uh, didn't force anything on them. And then the people, the rest of the people in the city, when they came to know Jesus, um, I I'd like, is there a volunteer um, to, uh, to read again here with the, uh, the Samaritan woman um, in verse, uh, well, it's up on my screen. So I guess I'm going to read it because it's not on your page in front of you. Uh, it's chapter four, verse 42. It says, they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this really is the savior of the world. So this is this is all on the heels of uh, of Jesus sharing the message with the Samaritan woman. So after that, we did also cover the healing of, of an official son because Jesus left Samaria and went to Galilee and spent an extended period of time there. This uh, healing of the official son, which is on the top of the sheet I handed out, um, not not the whole story, but uh, with John chapter five. Um, that that's the only thing recorded in this number of months that Jesus and the disciples were in Galilee. You see, John doesn't repeat the things that the other gospel writers share. He just uh, shares additional details and this miracle of, of faith. Uh, there's something of, of faith that stands out in this um, in this officer son, the royal official son uh, who is healed because Jesus doesn't touch him. Jesus isn't even in the same room. Right, the man asks for him to heal the son, and Jesus um, sends him on his way and says, "Your your son will live." And uh, how quickly was the son healed? Yeah, instantly. But the man didn't know it until I mean he went on his way, right? And then and then as he's on his way, he finds out from his servants who came to meet him, "Yeah, uh, your your son's well. He's healed." When did it happen? exactly the same hour that Jesus spoke the word, you, your son will live. Um, so if just to, to summarize that miracle of the official son, uh, there's a number of purposes we can sometimes say for a miracle. Uh, what would the, this purpose have been? Sometimes it fulfills a number of them, uh, but uh, sometimes one really stands out. And I guess I haven't done this with you all for a while. So what per why would Jesus do a miracle? Well, he, he did it to fulfill prophecy. He did miracles to identify himself as the, uh, as the true God, right? He did it to show compassion. And I just drew a blank on the fourth one. Anybody tell me what the fourth one is? <laughs> so to show compassion, to prove he's true God, to fulfill scripture. And then we'll have to, well, do we have to do the, I'll figure out the fourth and it'll come back to me later, but uh, what, which of, oh, of one for this very miracle to, uh, to bring people to faith or to strengthen people's faith, okay? And so with this one, the man uh, comes to Jesus asking for him to heal his son. Now Jesus shows compassion, that's there. Jesus shows his power as God, that's there. But the main one that stands out is the faith because this man came with a weak faith, come and heal. And Jesus kind of says, well, if I don't do a miracle, you're not gonna believe. And the man says, if you don't do anything, he's gonna die. And Jesus says, go. And so he leaves, your son will live. And that faith is grown. And not only that, the faith of everybody who knew. So that, uh, that is the, uh, that's what I was gonna ask you <laughs> if that stands out, but so it does stand out for you, right? <laughs> it's the strengthening or, or, or strengthening of his faith. Um, any comments or questions from that, that miracle? And I hope I didn't, conf if I confused you, let me try to clear it up uh, for those purposes of this miracle. And maybe we can do that with this miracle in John chapter five as well, um, as we get to it, a healing at the pool. Um, if you were taking notes, you can maybe put down, all right, was Jesus showing compassion? Is he fulfilling scripture? 
Is he identifying himself as the son of God or is he bringing people to strength or, or strength, bringing people to faith or strengthening their faith? So one of, the, one of those four usually stands out. Sometimes it is, it is a combination. So we'll get to John 5 now, the healing at the pool. Uh, a volunteer here who would uh, enjoy reading for me. Uh, Dave, you want to take, uh, um, let's go ahead and just take verses 1 through 6. So that uh, short yeah. paragraph and a big paragraph. After this, there was a Jewish festival, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool called Bethesda. Bethesda in Aramaic, which has five colonnades. Within these lay a large number of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, who were waiting for the movement of the water. For an angel would go down at certain times into the pool and stir up the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease he had. One man was there who had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had already been sick a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? So we have, we have setting, setting the stage for, for this miracle. Uh, first of all, where is Jesus going or where has he gone, according to that first verse? Jerusalem. And what's the purpose of his trip there? A festival. Anybody know that one of the three festivals that this would have been? We don't know which one for sure. It says a festival. The three festivals were one in April, Passover, one usually in May, Pentecost, okay, and then one usually in October, Tabernacles or the Feast Festival of Tents. And that one in October is associated with the Great Day of Atonement uh, as well. So, so one of those, uh, those, uh, those events would have happened and it did very well. I'm not sure you even re read your, the notes to, to follow along and find those answers. And, the, and that's the key for those of you with the sheet of paper in front of you. Um, oftentimes the questions I ask have the answer in the notes. I'm just checking if you're, if you're following ahead. Um, <laughs> Bethesda, and you know that Hebrew word, what does that mean? Beth is house, and so Bethesda is actually the house of mercy, house of compassion or mercy, and, and um, interesting that, uh, that it has that name. Uh, some of you might be familiar with a, uh, a care facility or a series of care facilities uh, that another church body uh, does in Wisconsin, and they are Bethesda homes, Bethesda the, uh, it's not there anymore. The yeah. one. They, 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 they've moved around and they've, they've got they've different places. Yeah. So, so that, but the, the, the name, the, the House of Mercy, and it comes for, they named it after that because of this, uh, this, uh, this miracle in part. So uh, Aramaic, Bethesda, um, House of Mercy. And anybody intrigued by the movement of the water? Why were all the sick and lame people hanging out by the water? Did an angel really come and stir the water and make the people, the first one in the water got healed? Have they seen miracles there? Had, had they seen miracles there? What, what, what's going on? Um, well, it, now you'll no, notice at the end of verse five, uh, there's a footnote. Anybody, anybody follow in, in your own Bible and want to share what the footnote uh, says there? Okay. I'll, I'll share what it says, okay? So some witnesses to the text omit the text from verses 3b to the end of verse 4. So it, that means there's a textual variant, which it's very possible that someone copying the Greek manuscript came to this verse and he knew why the lame people were hanging out by that pool. He was aware of the tradition of superstition, right? Okay, you, the water moves and you get the water and you get healed, okay? So a superstitious tradition, belief that, that people, people followed. That, oh, can angels stirring the water, God's going to heal them. So he might've written it in the margin. 
and then later later editions actually put that margin note in parentheses in in the book right and so it could be that this is a variant that's added but it could be that this is actually there and the context of the greek while it does say you right who were waiting for the movement of the water for an angel would go down at a certain time and the 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 greek of it leaves the opportunity for this to be an explanation of what the people thought not a dictation of the miracle that god performed through an angel okay does that make sense dave well if it's if it's in the bible as it's written right here mm -hmm. whose word is it well it's, it's god's word so yeah it can't really be a superstition then, can it? okay so if the if the bible here and the Greek allows for it with the, the potential of the wood, the angel would go down. Um, and the Greek is a little different than, than our English, that it leaves the, the setting, le leaves it for the understanding that, you know, that it was what people thought happened. It was why, explaining why they took the lame to that place. Um, so, so I'm not, I don't want to discount your, your faithfulness or your, your trust or reliability in the word of God. Um, uh, but as it, as it says here, we don't, uh, it, it's not dictating that that is the, uh, that is the miracle that God performed at this, at this place, an angel stirring the water. What is the miracle that's going to stand out? more than you haven't heard it yet jesus is going to heal the guy right by proclamation not by trickery and throwing him in the water when the wave happened right um but so again ho hopefully uh, any questions or comments on that i'll clear hopefully clear any of that up i guess my notes might uh um just say this some manuscript variants omit 3b through 4 they explain a superstitious thought that that many believed, and not that a healing angel moved the water. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's that parenthetical explanation that may have been John, the gospel writer's parenthetical explanation. It may have been uh, the the note taker. Um, so in, in the English, um, the four explanation. It couldn't maybe it's not explaining exactly what happened always but explaining what the people expected to happen right any any other questions or comments on that um, var variants are always just a little bit of a, a tricky thing as you recognize there weren't xerox machines um it's kind of more like the the uh, ghosts from the manuscript when i uh not real ghosts but uh computer ghosts from the previous versions that all of a sudden pop up when i'm in the middle of typing something and um you'll see my bulletin sometimes will state 2019 or something it's actually 2022 but uh anyway um those those xerox machines weren't in existence back then computers weren't it was all handwritten so you can understand how a copyist might have inserted a, a side note or a margin note into the text or, or whatnot so some of that uh, has hap happened there all right now uh, moving on about this man what else do we know what all do we know about this man we don't know his name but what can you tell me about the man sick for 38 years can you describe his illness yeah could not walk all right and when Jesus asks a dumb question, it's not a dumb question, but it sure seems like a dumb question at first, doesn't it? 38 years sick, sitting by the water. Do you want to get well? Um, yes, right? So, but what, what is Jesus doing by asking that? Not a dumb question, it's an obvious question. What, what does that do when, when, when you ask something that that's gets, obvious. Gets their attention. Gets his attention. That's the one side. That de definitely got his attention. Okay, I'm gonna look at you. Pay attention to you. I didn't know. I didn't know you were a miracle worker. Don't know who you are, but you've got my attention. Because why? 
So that's the aside of the individual gets his attention. What is Jesus indicating by asking the question? I am paying attention to you, right? That's why he got his attention. So there's two sides to it. I'm paying attention to you, which is valuable in and of itself, and then getting his attention when Jesus has something important to share. So, uh, so yeah, that's when, when Jesus asks an obvious question, there's a reason. He's showing care and compassion, but then also getting his attention because Jesus doesn't just want to heal him. What does he want to do with his heart? Bring him to faith. Bring him to faith. Okay, any questions or anything else uh, through verse six? Okay. Uh, another volunteer to continue reading. Uh, Rosie, would you mind uh, starting with verse seven? And uh, go ahead and take it through verse 10. <clears throat> I'm going to summon all schools ahead of me. Jesus said to them, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Just give the man what's here. He picked up his mat and walked. Okay. So here we've got two, you know, a couple verses, three verses, I guess, and the miracle's done. This is the extent of the physical miracle for this whole chapter. It happens really early on in the chapter. And we're gonna have the rest of the chapter is gonna be talking about the results of it. Um, I think the movie that would be made about this. We spend a whole lot of time on the physical miracle, but God's indicating this, this physical healing isn't the most important thing, right? Um, the man, what did he have faith in at the beginning? The movement of the water, right? Um, if I can get in the water at the right time, right? And oh, and if I explain it to Jesus, this guy that's asking, do you wanna get well? Maybe he'll pick me up and throw me in right when the water moves and then I'll get better. Okay, that may have been what he's thinking, right? Some, but it's because someone else gets down ahead of me. Uh, so he's, he's, uh, he's the lame. And so he's probably sicker or more disabled if we want to compare it that way than the people around him. He couldn't get into the water in time. And how quickly does Jesus answer? Get up, pick up your mat, walk. Right? And if Jesus had asked a silly question, do you want to get well, just to get his attention, Jesus had a, how do you know he, he, Jesus got his attention? Because he got up and walked. He didn't say, I can't, that's why I'm sitting here, right? No, he did. He got up and walked. So, uh, so it led him to, um, to action, uh, basically taking Jesus at his word. And the man was healed picked up his mat and walked. Um, one of the interesting things here, and then my note on the side, this is one of the miracles performed for someone who did not yet have faith. Right? His faith was in the water moving. Yes, he was paying attention to Jesus after that question, but he didn't have faith yet because we're going to see a little bit later, he didn't even know who Jesus was yet, even after he did the miracle, right? Uh, he didn't have an inkling that Jesus could help him, but we're going to see that uh, that uh, that miracle is done, um, and Jesus isn't going to leave him at that. The important thing is what follows, and there's a series series of events that uh, that continue on. Uh, any question uh, for me on on that on, on this miracle through through ten of uh, Mark? Please. Um, the thing that I was thinking about is that it isn't been a man that. By the pool for a long time, 38 years, and waiting to get into the water at the right time along the way. And this man comes up and says, Get up and pick up your mat and walk. Can you imagine the other people around the pool at that time going, What just happened? Yeah, uh, yeah, there are other people around. How did they react? Well, we're going to see part of them in just a little bit, right? Uh, part, part, of, part of the, the reaction. But um, yeah, that's what Jesus' miracles did, right? They called attention to his power. The, the, the result of his miracle, I think we've used, the, we, we talked about signs and wonders, some two terms used for miracles, right? The signs showing he's the Messiah, showing he's God. Wonders, wow. Right? And I think for the other people around it, around this miracle, it would have been the wow for this man, we're going to see it's a sign that uh, that brings him to faith. So, 
But yeah, good comment. Any, anyone else in, on that through verse 10? All right. A volunteer to continue reading um, 11 through 13. David? That day was the Sabbath. So Jesus told the man who had been healed, this is the Sabbath. You are not permitted to carry your mat. He answered them, the one who made me well told me, pick up your mat and walk. Then they asked him, who is the man who told you, pick up your mat and walk? <clears throat> but the man who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Okay. And uh, yeah, thank you for picking up the end of verse nine, which uh, I think we hadn't read yet, because that's important. What day was it? Sabbath. Sabbath, which for our days of the week is Saturday, but that was the holy day. Don't do any work on the Sabbath day, the day of rest. All right. Um, so the Jewish people who saw him carrying his mat were so happy he got healed. They just praised God, didn't they? You're all better. Wow. I'm so happy for you. No, no, no care, no compassion, no, no rejoicing with him and his and the blessing he had received. Rather, what's going on? You're working. It's Saturday. You can't carry your mat. Don't do any work. So the, so what is this with the Sabbath day? Um, it's the day of rest, so they were to rest from their labors, not working in the fields, um, take not not going to their place of employment, uh, certain tasks they, they shied away from in order to focus on God's word that day. Right? Uh, and Jesus elsewhere uh, indicates that uh, that the religious leaders added any number of laws and distinguishing how many steps you could take that's work and what sort of actions how much weight you could lift the, the, this long detailed thing about what constitutes work on the sabbath and what doesn't why didn't god give that long list of what constitutes work on the sabbath giving the very details of how many steps you can take yeah. well uh, they, they were looking at jesus as just a man yes not god and he instituted this rest for yeah. Yes, that's what Jesus himself said. Uh, I'm just going to repeat what you said uh, for online. Um, they, in, they saw him as a man, not God, and God instituted this rest for people, for men. Uh, please, Christine, do you have an uh, ongoing thought? Because uh, that's excellent. Um, yeah, that was all. Okay. All right. Anyone else? So Jackie. Well, just another thought. for 38 years or what but just I mean if nobody was helping him get in the pool who was taking care of his his earthly needs his food and his personal needs and stuff yeah he, who, who was taking care of him we don't know right was there anybody you know it <laughs> seems like he couldn't survive on his own maybe someone was helping him with a minimal to survive but uh saw it as a burden we don't we don't know but so Jesus giving him attention <laughs> Um, uh, getting back to, to the Sabbath day, um, yeah, Sandy? Well, that, these were Jewish laws, not God's law. Exactly. Jewish laws had, had added any number of things to, to make it easier to obey, or at least to, under, to think you're obeying. If I can itemize out what's work and what's not, then... I don't have to like evaluate all of my priorities and kind of get my mental thinking and my heart in the right place, which is what God wanted. God wanted their heart focused on the word, the promise of the coming savior. So he says, don't do any work, focus on my word for a day. Trust in me for a day. Trust in me that, that your physical labor isn't the only thing that's going to provide for you. That you're gonna take a day of rest and know God will provide, like the manna. They didn't go out and harvest manna on the Sabbath because what did God do? He gave a double portion the day before. And usually if they collected extra, it rotted overnight. But on Friday night, it didn't rot. So you got to eat it the second day, right? So there was faith in God to provide. God did so many things like that to help them focus on the word of his promise. 
And that's why he doesn't itemize out what's work, how many steps, how much weight, what sort of other things you, you, you can do. Because he said, I want your heart. I want you to think about this. Um, and, and for some of us, work is going to be taking 20 steps. Some of us is going to be walking two miles. Some of us, one mile isn't to walk, isn't work, right? So, so we, we're gonna, we have that way that we evaluate our, our priorities, which was the whole, and Jesus is gonna go on to, uh, to help, help the leaders and the other people understand that they're focused, by focusing on the law, they were losing the main point of their need for a savior. Um, okay, so, um, I guess, yeah, so in my notes on verse 10, so Jesus knows it's the Sabbath. He knows people are going to find out. He told him to pick up his mat, but he heals on the Sabbath anyway. He doesn't wait till Monday morning. Why? By, by bringing up this Sabbath day conflict with the Jewish leaders, Jesus is going to draw attention to himself and to his person. So we're going to move beyond the Sabbath day and now talk about who Jesus is, which is really where this chapter is leading, leading us. And why do we want to know where, who Jesus is? That's where we put our faith. Right? I, I, I interrupted. Was that what you were going to say about faith? Okay. Uh, ask a question, then I answer it before I give you a chance. So I apologize um, for that. Um, all right. Somebody tell me how far we got with the reading. Through 13. Through 13, okay. So, yeah, Jesus slipped away into the crowd. We see that point. Um, so someone gets a fun job of reading 14 and 15, which means you got a page turn in there. Billy, can I? Can you turn that? Is that too much work for you to turn the page? I think I got it. You got it, all right. <laughs> Later, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Look, you are well now. Do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse happens to you. A man went back and reported to the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. Okay. So Jesus finds him, doesn't leave him with that, uh, that concept uh, of not knowing who Jesus is, right? You're well now. Don't sin anymore, so nothing worse happens to you. I got a few notes in there that kind of explain that statement, but does... Is that statement of Jesus a little confusing? Do you need clarification? Do you think you understand something that should be clarified? Um, was he lame because he had done a great sin? Was he lame because he had done a, some great sin? We don't know, right? So um, yeah, don't, don't sin anymore kind of brings that thought. Was, was he lame because of a sin? We don't know, it's possible. What else comes to mind with that statement of Jesus? Well, it's just the importance of faith rather than the physical side. Okay. Yeah, it's the faith in, uh, rather than the physical side. Um, yeah, you are well now, but there's more, right? There's more than just being well. Right? Uh, what about at the end of that sentence? Nothing worse happens to you? What is, where, does, where does your mind go with that thought? Condemnation in hell, right? Separation from God forever. All right. So if that's what the something worse really leads us to, because that is going to be the worst thing that occurs if you live in unrepentant sin. All right. So Jesus is moving, and I think he's probably moving. I don't. I don't think that Jesus is declaring. Right. No, Jesus is not declaring this illness was caused by a sin. That's a possibility. But the focus is on the now. Don't sin anymore. Okay? Don't sin anymore. Don't go on living in unrepentant sin. Don't go on living in selfishness. Don't go on living in disregard to the law and even how the law and the prophets point to a savior coming. Don't live only focused on your physical needs. Repent, right? And if he doesn't repent, doesn't say that he's going to be lame and paralyzed from the nose down, right? Rather than just the chest down. We, what, what, what is the worst thing that's going to happen if he lives in unrepentant sin? 
He's going to go to hell. Don't let that happen. So Jesus doesn't explain all of that here, but this is a conversation that he's working with the man, and this is just the part that at this time, John has been inspired to, to share with us. Um, so the man in verse 15, with this little bit that Jesus has shared, what does he do? Okay, why? I don't answer that one on the sheet. I want your thoughts. Why would he go report to the Jews that Jesus, the, the Jewish leaders, oh, the, yeah, it's Jesus. He's the one who healed me. He identified himself. Now I can tell you who he was. Because when earlier he said, well, the man who told me to get up also told me to pick up my mat. Right? Why would he say it? When little brother tells mom and dad what you did, anyone ever have that happen? Maybe if you didn't have a little, maybe big brother, big sister. Big sister goes and tells mom what you did. What do you call? Tattletale. Was he being a tattletale to the Jewish leaders? Was he trying to get Jesus in trouble? I don't think so. But it's going to, that's what results. But so I don't, I don't think he's being a tattletale. Any other thoughts? Well, but I see it here. It's a reported to the Jews. Okay. Was this man a Jew? Yes, he would have been a Jew. Yeah. Uh, and it's a okay tradition. Again, is that okay? He would tell the leaders. Right, so this is respect for the authorities. Respect the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, they were the religious authorities. They were failing at it by leading people away from God, but they were still the authorities. Did Jesus show respect to the religious authorities? Did he respect the Sanhedrin? Yes, he showed them honor and respect. He also corrected them when they failed. And he's going to do that later in this chapter. But yes, I think he goes reports it to the authorities for one reason, because he is respecting their authority. Second reason, he had left some unfinished business with them when he said, I don't know who healed me. <laughs> so let's clear up unfinished business. Now I know. Let me go back and tell you. Okay, that, that, so I, we say, see that as well. Any, any other reason that you can think of why he might have gone to report it to the authorities? Could it just be his excitement? Like, uh, the physical, that's what I was yeah, uh, excitement about the physical as well as the faith. And we're going to see that, um, that, that the faith is growing slowly. So especially later on, that excitement, the excitement, excitement here seems to still be, okay, he physically healed me. And Jesus is leading him slowly towards that next point you mentioned, the, the, the excitement about not just healed in body, but healed in soul. Yeah, good, good comment, good thought. All right, do you want to continue a little bit here? Let's get, we got about five, six minutes to go. Um, and it's kind of, this is, it would have been a good stopping point, but I'm not going to stop. We got to kind of, we, the man doesn't know Jesus fully yet. And we got some trouble brewing with, with uh, Jewish leaders. So let's, let's dig into that just a little bit more. Uh, verses 16, uh, 16 through 18, a volunteer to read. Mark, go ahead. So the Jews began to persecute Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working right up to the present time and I am working too. This is why the Jews tried all the more to kill him because he was not merely breaking the Sabbath, but was even calling God his father, making him equal to God. Okay, so what was the way the Jews began to persecute? We don't know the details, but talking bad about him, uh, making things difficult for him, opposing him. But why? Because of what he did on the Sabbath. So, okay, he's breaking the Sabbath law. We're going to be on you for that Sabbath law. But what does Jesus declare in verse 17? This is what I commented on earlier. By doing the miracle on the Sabbath and telling the man to pick up his mat, Jesus opened the door for he's calling himself God. The Pharisees would consider it blasphemy, but it's a something that he came to do and show. So maybe 
reveal himself as the true God, another purpose of this miracle, right? As we develop it here, uh, as we develop uh, and find out, because he definitely showed compassion. We've seen him identify himself as true God, and we're working our way towards maybe in this chapter, um, bringing a man to faith, which ultimately for me stands out, is, but I shouldn't, I'd tip my, tip my hand, right? Show my cards before we get to the end of the chapter. Um, so yeah, Jesus identifying himself. Explain, my father is working right up to the present time. Didn't the father stop working on creation and rested on the seventh day? Is he still working? Absolutely. Yes and yes, right? Yeah, you can answer both of those questions, yes. Didn't the father stop his work of creation after six and rested on the seventh? Yes. So is God still working? Yes. Someone mentioned, how is he still working? Um, David, was that you? That, that, uh, how, how is he continually working? What would happen if God stopped uh, keeping the sun in place? It would fall out of the sky. This is called his work of preservation, right? So God continually works in, in preservation. Um, what does God do? Oh, please, Celia. All of these examples of preservation, the list is endless of the things that he continues to do in his work of preservation. And if you ever teach history or study history, you taught history in a Lutheran school, did you ever divide history out into two words? His story. His story. Okay. In a Lutheran school, you say it's his story. It's God's story. Who's directing history? And the Lutheran Reformation, Augustine, the Council of Nicaea, World War II, presidential elections. Who's guiding history? We don't always really see why, but God continues that work. So, um, yeah, so, so yes, God is continuing to work, and Jesus is saying, oh, and, and does God take a break? one day of the week from his work of guiding history. So if it happens on Saturday, well, God not, might not have, but it happens Sunday, that's God's guidance. Saturday, no, no, God continually is working. Um, and then the big point, was there any doubt among the Jews, Jewish leaders about what Jesus was saying? Any doubt about Jesus claiming to be true God? How do we know they didn't doubt his claim? Angry to pers enough to persecute him. And what happened to that persecution? It's called an escalator, isn't it? The anger escalated to what point? Persecution and what did they want to do in verse 10? They wanted to take it all the way to the highest level. They wanted to kill him. That's how much they they wanted to to stop him and persecute him anybody who ever would say oh jesus was a great man but but you know he never claimed to be god have you read the bible jesus continually claimed who he was and his enemies knew who he was and that's why they wanted to kill him he made that claim very often because he called god his own father making himself equal with god now I think I've taken you to a point where you're up, we have a cliffhanger for next week, so you all have to come back. All right, any questions you want uh, to ask me through verse, uh, through the end of verse 18? If some of you become, serve as my scribe and make sure I start at the right point next week, I would appreciate that. Uh, all right. uh, why don't we wrap up the things with, with prayer and blessing. Lord God, Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for your compassion. But even greater than your compassion in our lives, uh, the way that you have brought us to faith and that you strengthen our faith. Continually do that work, O oh Lord, and allow us to trust in you as the true God, as our Savior. Amen. All right, we will worship in about 15 minutes.